Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's edition of HR Mentorship Knowledge Sharing Session. Tonight, we'll be looking at a topic titled Effective Onboarding, Key to Employee Retention and Productivity. Effective Onboarding, Key to Employee Retention and Productivity. Our facilitator for tonight is Mrs. Chidema Justina OBJC. And I would like to just read a bit about her profile so that some of us may get to know her better. She is the group head, human resources for the Megalectrix group, who are the operators of four radio brands, the Beat 99.9 .9 FM, Classic 97.3 FM, Niger FM 102.7 FM, Lagos Talks 91.3 FM, with over 12 radio stations in Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt, Ibadan, and the United Kingdom. Chidi is the immediate past national treasurer of the Chadar Institute of Personnel Management, Nigeria, the foremost HR institute in Africa, and the regulatory body for practice of human resource in Nigeria, empowered by Act 58 of 1992, Federal Republic of Nigeria. Chidi has also served in various capacity at both the executive and other committees of the branch and chapter level, including financial secretary, chapter chairman, chapter vice chairman, and Lagos State branch chairman, which is a flagship branch of the institute. Chidi is married to Frank OBJC, and they are blessed with amazing children. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting for the first time on this platform, Chidi. Justina OBJC, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, my brother Oluyemi. I want to say thank you to all of you. I'm very excited to be on this, your great platform today. I'm also a member of the team, you know, even if I've been very quiet. So it's, a, it's amazing to be here and it's quite a pleasure. I would also extend my gratitude to all members who have joined and those who would join later. I, I think I take particular interest with the book club because it enables, it enables me to read a lot of books and get a lot of reviews. But let me first of all appreciate you. Sometimes in my quiet moment, I sit down and I wonder how do you keep this up every weekend? I mean, Saturday, Sundays, I just see the flyers and I say, wow, thank you for the great work you are doing. Thank you for what you are doing for the profession as a whole and for humanity. Today, my dear colleagues, we're going to learn from each other. And what we'll be talking about, of course, like we have seen, is something we all have heard about, something we all have said before, something we all do. But why are we looking at this today? It's because there may be need for us to take a look at it again together and see where we are getting it right and where we are not. And that is why we decide that we're going to talk about onboarding. Onboarding, you will agree with me, is a buzzword in the HR profession. Every new HR person or even non-HR person knows what onboarding is about. But what, today we'll just look at it and see how have we been doing this? What is the benefit? And are we doing it? Are there gaps? We need to cover up. That's why this topic is coming up today. And why this particular to to topic? Warren Buffett said, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and only five minutes to ruin it. If we think of, about that, then we there may be need to do things a bit differently. Talking about the space of employment or business organization, we, it, it, a, a big organization may exist. And of course, people would have been talking about this organization, but it takes just five minutes for a new hire or somebody to just look at it and say, no, that organization is not worth it. And the word goes out there and the reputation is ruined. So onboarding is very powerful and something we just need to look at today. And that's what we are all going to do here. Those of us here and those that are still joining. Thank you. So what to us is this onboarding? And uh, it would be great if we can make this session interactive. Maybe we can all begin to chat to, in our own understanding. What do we think? Well, how would we define onboarding? What is this onboarding we are talking about? 
do we want to share? Let us hit the chat box and share our thoughts and views about onboarding. Like we said earlier, most of us are, have heard or used that word, onboarding. Even if the person is just a student member of CIPM or just coming into the profession newly, I believe that we would have heard used that word onboarding. So what do we understand by onboarding? Do we want to share? I'm waiting for the chat box. I can't see any yet. Can anyone hear me? Um, Oluyemi, you would need to confirm. Can you hear me? Am I loud enough? Oh, yes, it's coming in. Ademola says the process of integrating new employees seamlessly into the organization. Yes, thank you very much, Ademola. That's great. Yes, that is onboarding. Do we have other thoughts around this? Do we have other thoughts around this? We've gotten one definition. Do we care to share something else? Any other thoughts? Onboarding is a process of initiating new employees and familiarizing them with process and culture, with the process and culture of our organization or that organization, that group, that society. So thank you very much. So we will move on. Those are very correct definitions. So I'll go to my next slide and we'll look at what I have there. So here, our learning objective will be what you've just seen. Let's understand the importance of onboarding, identify components, examine relationships between onboarding and retention and productivity, and then effective executive onboarding. The effect of onboarding on executive transition. And that is where I will dwell on more. So onboarding, like we said, is integrating a new employee into an organization cultures, policy, familiarize them with how we do things. But it's not just that. It's also integrating or familiarizing an existing employee into a new role. Aha, that is the second part of it that most of us do not think of, or even I do not think of until I began to experience it. We think of the new employees. Oh, we just have new hires. And we then think of how do we bring this person in? How do we make this person settle in comfortably? How do we make them understand their job? But what about the existing employee who have just moved into a new role? How about the employee who had just been promoted, either just moved into a new role because they, we are rotating jobs or because or promoted because they have been upgraded into a new position? from just a team member to a line head to a supervisor, what do we think? Is it also necessary to do onboarding for them or not? So we will also look at that today. So I have a chart here that says, okay, onboarding typically refers to the process of integrating and orienting new employees or users into a company system platform. It involves introducing them to the organizational culture policy procedures, as well as providing necessary training, resources to help them become productive and comfortable in their new role. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive definition. That is exactly what onboarding is. Integrating new employee, providing training, resources, support in whatever form, but it also goes beyond that. We may have a new employees in the organization who have just been upgraded, who have just taken up a new role. They also require onboarding because onboarding sometimes is not just about the company culture alone. Yes, this employee is, has been existing in the organization. I agree. And, and understands the culture, understands the polit politics, understands other things. But this employee is being moved into a new role. That person also requires to be onboarded. Maybe not orientation this time, but onboarded. I'll share an experience. Okay. Uh, some time ago, I upgraded a line head to a, a member of the team, my sports team, to supervise the other members of the team. This guy is very experienced. He's a, he has worked in media. He has worked in television, radio, sports. He's well known. So I didn't believe that it would be a problem. 
He's also, he has over 20 years experience, but he had, in our organization, he wasn't managing the team before now. So as far as I was concerned, he was okay because he's matured, his experience is this. And then on this road, six months down the line, we called him up to say, oh, we can't, we had a review and said, we can't confirm you on this road because your line head is saying you are not meeting expectation. He's not getting the feedback or the report or things he wants from you. Mm -hmm. And the guy was like, I don't understand. Nobody told me he wanted reports from me. Nobody told me I didn't get this communication that I needed to attend meeting. I was just doing things my way. And I told myself, I said, wow. So that was an eye opener to me. So what we had to do was that we went back and drew an onboarding schedule. We then ran the onboarding because now he's handling a different role. So his relationship with even other departments is, will be different from what it used to be. Before he was simply a team member. He comes to work, he delivers on his role, he, uh, whatever he needs to do, he tells whoever is the aligned head and the person has to report to management. The person has to go to marketing, have to go to accounts. Even if he's going to marketing on a, and accounts, it's for a personal business. It's for something that is peculiar to him, not for the entire team. So now he needed to understand his the role of that position when it comes to relating interdepartmentally, when it comes to relating with other line heads, when it comes to relating with his direct boss, who is the GM, as well as the other members of management. When it comes to, um, as the line head, playing that role of managing his people in respect to the company's policy and all that, those were things that didn't occur to him. And we took it for granted that, oh, after all, he's been in the organization. In fact, I met him in the organization. He's been in the organization for over seven years. He's an experienced um, sports person. So what is there to tell him? But he, even he needed that uh, session, that briefing and things like that. So we'll just move on. So having said that, So we'll look at one thing that we use interchangeably, that is onboarding and orientation. Even I made that mistake earlier. When we say onboarding, sometimes we also mean orientation. So can we please share the difference between onboarding and orientation? We have actually um, explained or defined onboarding, but now looking at onboarding and looking at orientation, it is easy for some of us, if you are like me, to believe that they are the same thing, or, orient, or employee orientation, employee onboarding. At a stage, at a point, it seemed like, well, it's just a new buzzword. You are, we are like, we normally change terminologies in HR, but they are actually different. And here, I've well, been able to call up the different, this was gotten from the internet, where we could see it captures all we would like to talk about. Onboarding on one hand is employee specific role in his or her department. It has to do with the job description. It has to do with the requirements of the role. It has to do with expectation from uh, the expectation from the line head. It has to do with the, the that position in connection, in alignment with the strategic goal of the organization. Why? The orientation is uh, refers to just that role specifically. If you are a news presenter, if you are a HR person, if you're an accountant, what are you supposed to do? But you know that there are, there are different categories of accounting. There are different roles within the accounting department. So if you just give explanation of, or allow the, the employee to get familiar with just the accounting departmental functions, what about their specific role? Are they doing auditing? Are they cost accountants? Is this reconciliation? What is the alignment of their role in connection with the organizational goal? Another thing is duration. Ongoing, on, onboarding lasts for a longer period. Um, orientation could be a one-week thing, a two-day thing. An employee resumes. We take them around. We introduce them. We tell them about the company policy and then they settle into their role. We hand them over to the department. But that's at that point, the onboarding just started. 
We need to take them through the politics, socialization of the organization. We need to make sure some organizations even appoint like mentors. They appoint buddies for them, friends who will take them on that journey. So that an employee's onboarding period isn't one week. It is not two weeks. It goes into months, two months, three months. I think that if you ask me, the duration of that probation period is an onboarding time. We keep checking back. We keep finding out how they are doing, and we keep trying to make amends where there are gaps. Onboarding, most of it takes place on the job. Why orientation will just be something naturally we set up, and we can have two, three, four, ten new employees sitting there. We come into like a classroom thing. It's done these days on both online and then physical. And then we talk to them about what we need to tell them about the company's culture. It could be policy. It could be a process and procedure. It could be um, the company's goals, mission, value. We talk to them about that. Now, what is the content? For orientation, the content is usually an overview. While for onboarding, it's specific to each employee. I have said that before. Then um, outcome. The outcome for orientation is to get the new employee ready to start working at the beginning. Their documentation, their uh, information, staff file requirements, compensation, process for leave and all that to get them start to start working and ready to take their job trading. Why for onboarding is to get the employee ready to be productive, ready to be productive. Like someone said, the aim of onboarding is to make a great, turn a great hire into a great employee. Because we also know that a great hire may turn out to be a bad employee in the process, within that process of probation, if onboarding is not well handled. Someone who came up, who wanted to work in the organization, well motivated, well inspired, and was eager to come in, may eventually just turn out to be a get along the line if onboarding was not well handled. Yes, a hand raised. You want to say something? Can anyone hear me? Only hear me, please confirm. Ah. Am I being heard? Okay, okay, now I know I'm being heard. Okay, thank you. So, um, onboarding, like we said, is to get the employee to be productive because like we said, it is not about engaging an employee. The aim of any hire is to for us to ensure that the person is able to deliver value. And that is what onboarding is, is supposed to help us do. If we get an employee and just abandon the employee, someone may be a great employee, great employee, wonderful. And then two months down the line, three months down the line, we are wondering what happened. What, what really happened? We thought this person was great. He scored very high, he was well-spoken. What happened? It could be that there is gap in our onboarding process. Thank you. So here are some of the importance of effective employee on body. And we have said that enhanced employee retention, that's one of it. Because for onboarding, it helps us ensure that employees, at least a higher percentage of them stay. Sometimes when we lose employees during the period of onboarding, if it is not well done, like I said earlier, the employee gets demotivated, the employee gets put off and begin to feel bad. Employees that come in and do not understand the social culture of the organization and begin to find out that it's a misfit. Men just leave the organization within those six months. And probably they may not be misfit, but it's just that there's a gap in trying to, um, <laughs> let me use that word, baptize them, trying to get them sink into the culture of the organization. It also increases productivity. Most employees, 
you notice that it enhances their work because when they understand their environment, when they understand their expectations, their job description, their key performance indicators, the expectations that is ex the things that are expected from them, how to relate with their colleagues, how to relate with team members and their line heads, how to communicate within the organization. If they feel that they have friends in the organization who supports them, if they also feel that HR and their line head is there for them, providing that support and feedback whenever required, the, 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 rate, of, the rate of productivity will definitely increase. But where we lose this, of course, that is where we find out that even we, the organization may be ready to fire this employee within a few months. Probably not because the employee is bad, the productivity is bad, oh yes. But what could be the reason? I'm going to share an experience later. Then it also improves job satisfaction. That is onboarding for you. So I will share this experience. Um, a few years ago, I got in a, we got in a presenter, like you know, I work with Mega Electrics and we deal with presenters a lot. The presenter was to um, co anchor a program with another presenter. You know, the way we speak is different from the way Britons speak. So this other lady was born in the United Kingdom, but she's in Nigeria, and she only came into Nigeria to work with the organization. So when we got this lady, she's from Port Harcourt. She worked in Port Harcourt. We met her there, and we felt that she probably has skills for a talk station. If I mention the name, you may know the person. And we put both of them to go anchor that um, session, that program. Every day there was issues. The, the colleague that is a UK born um, citizen couldn't just understand why someone would speak the way she speaks. And she kept reporting. She kept coming to HR to say, HR, this lady is a misfit for this program. I mean, she shouldn't be on radio. I mean, she shouldn't be this. And my position was, hey, this lady is still on probation. And um, I wouldn't want to let her go until I'm sure I've done what all that I'm supposed to do. I've provided enough support. I've heard you, but don't worry. We would sort this problem. And then we went on and on. We kept, I keep giving feedback. I would call the lady to say, what's going on? I will give her the feedback. Are you having challenges? What do we do? We called for training. They said her diction was very bad. Her pronunciation was bad. Well, you know, like I said, she's a Nigerian proper, wafi babe proper. This other one is a UK Brit. But while we don't encourage um, substandard production in our organization, but we still felt she had, she had qualities, she had potential. We went on and on and on. The UK born presenter eventually, in fact, at a stage, the GM called me and uh, was requesting that we fire that lady. I put my feet down. The reason I put my feet down is that I sense a kind of uh, oh, it's my program. You can't come in here. I don't like the way you talk. I want to own this program in law. So I then said, if I'm going to start, I'll take both of them out of the program. So that way, the whole thing was taught. But eventually, the UK Brit lady had to leave. She left because she felt, oh, so there are some things that went on. She resigned. She wanted us to take this lady out before she could withdraw her resignation. And we didn't do that. But lo and behold, before that lady stayed in our organization for six years, and in that six years, she was one of our brightest. I'm talking of the Wafi lady. She was one of our brightest presenter. She was winning awards here and there. Wallo showing cast a fellowship award, this, that. Her name was all over the place. And I was like, wow, is this how people can transform? So imagine that within that period of onboarding, we didn't know what she was struggling with. So imagine that we had let her go. We would have lost that talent. We would have lost the value she eventually added to the organization. We would have lost building up that potential. So that is what Umbody did. And she didn't leave until about six years after. Well, she got something bigger. But even then, she had gotten something bigger before again and again. And she keep coming back to us. And we keep keeping her. Because she would just come with her offer letter and say, please, uh, these people are giving me times two of what I'm earning. But if I can get just 
five percent on top of wife salary now. I don't mind. You don't need to match it. I want to stay with this organization. And she states. So those could be those are the some of the benefits of effective onboarding. So what are the key components of effective onboarding? Preparation, pre-boarding, which is preparation. What do we say? If you do not plan, you fail. So we really need to, once we have um, chosen, selected, confirmed by way of interview and selection, and then we have given offer, it is now time to begin to prepare for whoever is going to call me for, whoever we have decided to hire. The communications, the preparation, sending the mails before time to expect on what to expect when they come in. Giving them download of the company's policy and even preparing the line heads, the colleagues, members of staff, other members of staff that they will be interacting with to notify them that someone new is coming. It's not just on that day we are taking them around, but even when they resume, before they resume, I mean, colleagues should be aware that someone new is coming. They, sometimes we even give their brief a summary of their CV just to prepare the colleagues. And then that is our pre-boarding sessions. Um, orientation, of course, like we have said, that one week or one day classroom session where they are put through our policies, documentation, their job description and all that, getting them to start the job before they even go in, introduce them to other staff. Training and development. I do not see how good someone will be that they do not need training. And I said something, I said, no matter how experienced someone is, no matter how experienced a new employee is, when that person is coming in, you definitely need to onboard the person because how about the culture? And I say to people, you don't change what you do not know. So a person needs to get familiar with the way of doing things in that organization, with the way people do things, even if they are coming with um, a lot of ideas, innovative ideas on what to change. They can only change after they have understood how it's being done in the company. Then we have the proper integration, setting in into the organization and getting used to their job, their roles, their line heads, understanding the expectation from that particular role, the processes in the organization and others, and then continued support for the department. I expect that that is what we do that. On a monthly basis, we check on, on the new hire. How are you doing? What's going on? How is your relationship with your colleagues, your lunch, any struggles? And some, and then we look at what do we do to help? Proactive at this point. Who do we think is responsible for onboarding? We've been talking onboarding, onboarding, and we all know what it is. Who do we think should be responsible for onboarding? Is it the MD? <laughs> is it the marketer? The HR? The employee himself? Who is responsible, who is accountable for onboarding. Can we hit the chat box, please? Can we hit the chat box, please? Let's share ideas. The HR, thank you. Love it. Lucky says, the HR is responsible. The HR, thank you. HR, HR, HR. <laughs> thank you, Savia, the HR. The HR and the depart head of department. Thank you. Um, the HR and the head of everyone. Yes, thank you. The HR and the line head. Yes, thank you. The HR in collaboration. Okay. Yes, the HR, or oh, that is this. And I think it's shared responsibility. It's not just the HR, but the HR, the line head, the employee himself, the employee himself have a role to play. It's also a stakeholder in this process of onboarding. Why the HR brings, but even the line here participate in the process of interview and the HR is supposed to draw up and share the framework for that, the process. HR is the process owner for that job, for that onboarding profile, for this project. HR is the process owner. But the line head plays a critical role because when the HR have finished the basic orientation, 
the basic orientation of taking the staff around the documentation, the policy, and that doesn't last more than three days, one week at maximum. The staff then resume, the new employee resume in their proper department and the line hand has to take over, ensuring that all the way the employee does what they are supposed to do. For us, we have um, a broad onboarding program where the employee you need to interact will check in and ensure that this happens because you also send mail to those departments, to the line heads to remind them, to inform them, set up the meeting, sometimes virtual, sometimes physical, set it up and all that. But the line head is also responsible to ensure that the right thing is done, the employee understands his role, the employee understands his job description, the way it should be done, and also watch to see if the employee is struggling with something. I keep telling my line heads, I say, if you, you are the actual HR, you are the direct HR. So we would not know HR, we manage over 300 employees. And for the new ones, yes, we call them to check in, to give feedback. But we would not see them. If they don't come to work for one week, HR may not know. But the line head, you know. If they don't deliver on their job, HR doesn't know. The line head, you are aware. If, you, if they are handling a project or they are given a tax, they don't deliver on. HR, you know. Line head, HR would not know, but line head knows. So it's important that the line head is carried along and understands their role. Because the challenge is that sometimes the line heads don't understand their role. Thank you. Then the employee on their own side, the new employee, it is also their duty to make sure that they take in what they are taught. But not just that, since the framework, the process, the timetable is shared with both the new hire, the line head and other managers, the new hire is also his duty to ensure that those areas, those meetings happen and ask questions, and it's present, not just, oh, it's okay, oh, do you understand? Yes, ask questions, assimilate what is being taught, ask questions when they don't understand. It is the due responsibility of the line, of the enemy, unless you have contrary opinion. So there are several types of employee onboarding that we all deploy. We have the formal onboarding, which is a structured one that I've been describing. We have the informal one, which is where sometimes we appoint mentors, we appoint goodies that interact with them, check in on them, take them out for lunch, find out how they are doing, informally teach them how to settle into the organization. We have the technological base, of course, with COVID here. We are all doing hybrid. And for some of us who engage people outside of our location, who have several locations, you cannot but still use technology. We have the socialization part, and I've mentioned that some organizations also take them out for lunch on the first day or get other employees to let them lunch. And sometimes they have lunch even with the MD and how to familiarize, hang out with colleagues. If they have a football match, hang out so that he gets to settle in and make friends within the organization. Role specific onboarding, we understand that that has to do with the line manager on their specific role, on whatever the employee is supposed to do, the, the process, the procedures, the gaps, the challenges, the employee needs to understand that. Then cross-functional onboarding, of course, interacts with various departments because the, the departments are intertwined, none can exist without the others. So in my own organization, what we do is that yes, even from the first week, there is a timetable that ensures that the employee get to meet with all the department, all the line heads, all the departmental heads, and they put the employee through the process procedure, what they do in that department, so that the employee also get to understand that. So, um, one thing I want us to look at at this point, and I've mentioned it earlier, is executive onboarding. We are giving the, um, the example of our sports team. We also know that because someone is experienced, if we're engaging a finance director, for instance, 
who has over 12 years experience. The tendency is that, let me even ask, how many of us onboard them? Do we onboard, when I say onboard, do we onboard them and for how long? Can we please share experience for promotions to senior grade and for recruitment as senior level? Do we onboard them and how long do we do that? Please let's hit the chat box. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you for making this interesting for me and for sharing ideas. I'm waiting. Did we hear me? Please yeah. confirm. Major Ken, you hear me? Are you there? Did you hear me? Yes. Okay. We are thank here. You we can much. hear you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. So, please, colleagues, I want to hear from us. How long do we onboard? Do we come again with the question? Okay. I said for senior hires like director level, senior management levels, do we onboard them? And if we do, for how long? I want us to share that. Thank you. Do we think it's important? And how long do we onboard these people at this level, at the senior level? I'm waiting. If we onboard them, yes. How long is as long as necessary? Sometimes it could be even longer. Thank you. Uh, onboarding is important at all levels. Yes, I agree. With this lecture now, we don't onboard in my organization. It's orientation we do. Yes. No, Ted, we all do that. No problem. Yes, it's important. Maybe two weeks. Okay. We do ask for just two days for all levels. Okay. We will look forward to this now with what we have learned. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll just go on. So now, what I, why I asked that is that we had data that said that 40% of executive hires fail during their first 18 months of recruitment. And that cost some companies over $12 million. That is the cost of losing senior executives when we hire them. And I understand that the reason we do 10 years experience on the job. Imagine that you reached out to me and said, ah, Madam, come and work with us. And, it, and I come in. Or Lu Yemi, or anybody, you or some of us here who are also well experienced. The general understanding will be ah, she doesn't need much now. Just take her around two days, meet the MD, meet everyone. That, that. The rest of the other things she is on her own. Even sometimes. Some organizations will not even do the orientation. So you, the HR, will begin to say, how do I do? Even the orientation, they won't do. I'm not even talking of somebody. I had that experience. I joined a company that all they did was just to take me around. And I had to say, okay, when do I meet with the finance director? When do I meet with the marketing? I was the one trying to carry myself around. <laughs> Nobody sent me. So, but that is what we have. But look at the data I have here. If you look at this data and the legend I have, it said 34.8% said they have formal conducted by internal HR team. 2.5% said they have formal conducted with the use of external resources, maybe consultants. 14.0 said they combined the two. But check the people that don't have. You have 38.8% said informal only, no structured. And then no process at all. No process at all. You get 11.9. Uh, Combine that, that's about 47 or 48% said so they don't have any formal process. No formal process for executive um, hires. And that is dangerous. Because like I said, 40% of executive hires fail within the first 18 months of their recruitment. Why? Here is the reason. What is the top factors that has derailed your executive during their first two years in a row? 7% political missteps. 33% failure to establish key relationship and partnership. 7% lack of feedback. I've accused myself, I reported myself to you, you see, that for six months, I didn't get back to the line here to say how far. I felt, ah, he's been here before now. See, for over, I met him here, sir. So he knows what is being done. 
so you can relate with his lying head the way they want. I didn't check. So because I didn't check, it drew us back another three months because the guy didn't understand what we were talking about when we started asking him for those things. 31% say failure to align with company culture. And 22% say ineffective people management through team building skills. All these have something to do with onboarding. Ineffective onboarding, gaps in the onboarding. So if we have all this, don't you think that onboarding is something we need to do differently? Take a critical look at again, especially for the top management. Imagine how much it takes to recruit an executive member of the team. If consultants charge 10 or 20% of their salary and you have to pay like 5 million just to engage one senior finance director or even 2 million naira, and the person after paying salaries for over one year, two years, the person have to be fired or have to leave out of frustration because they feel they were not delivering. The impact on, of that, even on the, the return on, on investment did not happen. The impact on the bottom line is negative. Value have not been added for all that amount we spend, considering how much. In that case, we then need to take another look At our executive onboarding. And here, onboarding process, just some um, related onboarding process can make or break a new employee experience. I've said that severally. A good onboarding process improves new employee retention by 82%. A good onboarding process improves a new employee productivity by 70%. That's the source, Gallup State of American Work Plan Reports. So you, we see what I'm saying, that this is a very important process if we must deliver value on costs that we use to employ people. And here are some facts, which I just want us to run through. The average new hire is expected to complete 54 activities during their onboarding process to ensure that it's effective. Great employee onboarding can improve retention. 60% organization with structured onboarding saw 60% year-on-year improvement in revenue. It even has something to do because when you reduce employee attrition, when you, reduce, when you increase retention and productivity, the tendency is that the cost of replacement will reduce. So those are just some of the facts. And then we'll just go on. What skills do we need for effective onboarding? Effective communication, organizational skill, adaptability, and we have to be flexible. It's not a straightforward thing, depending on the employee, the nature of their work and things like, we need to tweak it from time to time. Training and development experience. Within that onboarding period, we also need to apply training. We need to know how to put them. It doesn't have to be go out and spend money. It could be on basic skills, team building, team bonding. It could be on effective um, management. It could be on interpersonal skills. We could do all that. Or personal effectiveness. That also helps employee experience. Because they come up feeling that, oh, it's even true that these people are here to support me. We also have collaboration, we have empathy and emotional intelligence. Collaboration, put them on projects so that they can interact with different groups. That should be an Practices for success. But here we have we have mentioned the clear communication. We must and go direct support, very clear. So employees about their job description. They don't understand what their roles, what they are expected to do. The sometimes it's well. 
So for new employees, for those that on is also personal approach, tailoring of the individual needs. Mr. A cannot be the same to Mr. B. So why we have a standard Hello. We can hear you, ma. Okay. I thought I lost you at one time. Yes, about okay. just about 10 seconds ago. Oh, sorry about that. So we were talking about the best practices. But I mentioned clear communication mentioned personal personalized ap approach involvement involving team members everybody have to be sure it's not just the line head alone because if you leave it to the line head the employee may feel continuous feedback regular check-ins from hr and evaluation let's not leave it to the line head let's you can make it a regular monthly city meeting with the employee to find out how they are doing if they have challenges if there is any way you have to come some of them, some of them have communication issues with their line head or with their team members' misunderstanding. And if not addressed early enough, you lose the employee. You just find out that the employee is frustrated, demotivated, and just want to leave the organization. But if we check in, we'll be able to address that matter before it escalates. Um, then the use of technology. We should also build in technology to make sure that it's a seamless experience and we do not make it very difficult for the employee. Well, we also need to measure they are the effectiveness of our onboarding process in the organization. And some of the metrics we may need to do during this period is time to productivity. What time do they deliver on set targets? And what is the level of productivity? What is the level of eff efficiency? Employee retention rate. How many employees were we able to keep? after the onboarding process that didn't have to just jump out, apart from those that needed to earn bigger salary. Employee engagement surveys, those are things we can also conduct in our organization to ensure that we get to understand whether our onboarding is being effective or not. Manager and peer feedback. We should also get feedback from the team members of the new hire and the line head to know how they are addition, whether they are bonding well, that would also help. Performance reviews, maybe quarterly, monthly, better. The more frequent, the better, if we can afford it, but it will be good. Then in terms of those in the sales department, how much we are able to bring is also a good way of knowing whether our onboarding worked or not. Customer satisfaction rating for those who do it, feedback from new hires. Because what we do, maybe even at the end of the first period of um, onboarding and orientation, we ask the employee to write back and say what they felt. Write back and say what is their own opinion. What feedback do they have? their experience so far. They should narrate their experience. Project completion, like I mentioned, I said we should put projects. But when we do, how often, how, what is the rate of completion of the things? And there are several others we cannot, we did not put here, but I'm sure that we know some of them now, if we didn't before. Those are some of the things we can use to measure our employees. So I am, we are rounding up. In conclusion, we've all heard what uh, onboarding can do for us as an organization in beefing up our retention rates, because the way at which the rate of employee mobility right now is quite high. Why we cannot blame that on just onboarding? Because even those who have stayed 10 years are jack buying and moving. But it's also a very sad thing if in an organization we engage a new employee and within six months, the employee just looking morose, willing to leave and just searching for job everywhere. Then our onboarding has not been effective. We need to take another look at our process. Also, for those, how many people are we promoting? Well, you know, sometimes, yes, 
we have to of saying some people are not meant to be leaders. So they are just technical people to do their work. We should have seen that before promoting them. But sometimes it's not about them that went. They feel confused by the new role. It's a bigger role. Someone who before we just sit on their own and don't uh, just complain when they need to complain. Now people come to them to complain. They, they, in their, the, among their team members, they need someone to do something. They come to work, the team member is not there, and the next thing they hear is that, sorry, sir, I wasn't feeling fine, or I need to take my wife to, to the hospital, or my wife to the hospital. And the man is thinking, is that what I'm going to arrive to the hospital? That is we probably a good of more prep there was a uh, yeah, on our platform that of some young lawyer. Okay, so let me that shared. Okay, he, he, he wasn't well prepared for that job because if he was well onboarded, it would not have been that he resumed and he was just taken to court with a matured law. Sorry, colleagues, I don't know where I lose you again, but I'm rounding up. Don't worry. I hope we hear me now. Did anyone hear me? We can hear you, but it's breaking, ma. Thank you, ma. Oh, okay. Is it better now? Is it better yes, it now? It's better, ma. It's better. Okay. It's better, ma. We can hear you very well now. Okay, thank you. I'll just quickly. So, like I was saying, that's the the young lawyer should have been taken out by a more senior person who would at least put the lawyer through. Continue to tell the young the process and the impact of those things that is and how to handle them. After a month or two, after seeing such scenarios, organizations, for CIM, for instance, if people don't, I normally insist on onboarding the new executive. Yes, they come in experienced people, but let's not believe that in our organization or even in this group that we are, if we decide to appoint new executive, that oh, they will just take off like after all, they'll be here. No. There should be an opportunity to let them go through the process of onboarding, training, explaining to them the expectations of their role so that they will also do not fulfill. Having said that, we'll just look at this quote. This is how to, you know what they say about bad impression? And is the internal and external customers. It is critical to actively think about the entire employee experience journey, entire journey of the customer, internal or external. Define it, map it, and document it all the way. Document it all the way. Be clear about it, state it. Having said that, I hope that we've been able to pick one or two things that we can apply. I will then wait for our questions. Thank you very much. My name is Chidi OBAJC. Thank you. God bless you all. Amen. I'll wait for your questions. <laughs> wait for your Thank questions. you. Thank, Thank you so much. This has been phenomenal. It's a real masterclass, also very timely. Not everybody can take a fundamental area and even demystify it even more. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. If you like to ask a question 
or you want to share one or Thank two experiences you, or add one or two things to contribute to tonight's discussion, if you raise your hands, we'll enable you to share your thoughts or questions. Oh, I can see my boss. I can see my boss, Oga Osea. You can unmute. I made you a co-host. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Madam Chidi, for the good thank presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. What, what I want to add is that onboarding is not only beneficial to the new staff and the organization, even to you as an HR person. Yeah. I had done that for more than 18 years. And some of the things I told some of them that uh, took my advice, you, they put it into practice. Most of the time now, when I meet with them after retiring for a few years, they keep thanking me that during the orientation, the things I told them and they put into practice, now they are benefiting from it. So I'm not benefiting financially, but my joy is complete because it's just like a teacher. When you see your student and he greets you, you maybe you meet somewhere and he greets you and introduce, ah, you are my teacher, you taught me that. that. That's the joy. So it's really important that we do that. We shouldn't also, just like she said, be too strict. We should not only <clears throat> confine our onboarding to only things that have to do with the, or the organization or the company or the roles. No, you can even go beyond that. Most young people, they don't know. They feel that they want something quick, quick, immediately. Once they start work one or two years, they want to ride jeeps, they want to have uh, bungalows or duplex and dress. No, you take them through and it will help them. Some of them don't know even how to use their money because all throughout their universities, the, their parents give them money. Even when they are working, their parents support them. They don't know how to use it. So you, it's during that time that you'll be able to advise them. And once you do that, they take it, they, it will be useful to them. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much, my elder, for sharing that experience. God bless you. Like you said, you mentioned something. You said it's also beneficial to the HR. It's not just the, the um, satisfaction that, oh, you have done something. I mean, it's part of our KPI. If, if a HR who cannot retain staff is good enough to be fired. So if you want to keep your job, you better pray that your own money is effective enough to retain the employees you hire. Thank you. I thought I should also add that to him. So it's not just for our bottom line, that is part of the cost the company will look at. If we're always spending money hiring, and then in six months they leave because they are dissatisfied, then we begin to look at our HR again. That is why as HR, we must take this very seriously. Thank you very much. There's a hand of so before before Rita Babalola comes up, yes, we'll take Rita now. But before we take it, there's a question I want to ask you. Don't answer yet, but I want you to ponder on the question. Then after Rita, you can answer it. The question is, if you are bringing in expatriates, are there any extra things to do for their own onboarding? If you are bringing in expatriates, are there any extra things or peculiar things to do for their onboarding? Meanwhile, you take that after Madam Rita. Madam Rita Babala, you have the floor, ma'am. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Mr. Adioshin, for the opportunity. And then, Madam Chidi, I really appreciate the way you were able to break this down. I just wanted to put in, I mean, one or two things, especially that last slide where you, there was a saying that, I, I didn't catch that saying, the last slide where you had like um, a saying that um, something like I could bring out of it is that like the cost of reworking it when you didn't do it in the first instance, the implication or the consequences is quite expensive. And I want to share examples of two organizations that I'm currently working with. When we they had um, a massive growth, they wanted to, they, they grew in terms of their um, scope of work. And then when we started with the recruitment process, we were bringing more people. And it was not only our organization that was recruiting for them. At a point, I got 
to speak to one of them as in the executives that it's high time that they had like an onboarding process. Let's harmonize the process because people were coming from different culture. But you know, sometimes we don't, we just think about the financial implications and don't know that the cost of not having this is just waiting for us later on in the I mean, in the organizational journey. So it got to a point when they started having issues in company A, let me say. It, some of the people we employed for them started resigning. I spoke to them again. It was still like a cost cost thing. Got, I, I even had to volunteer that, you know what, don't pay me. Let me just do this for, for you. But sometimes because also as HR people, we don't understand the difference between induction and onboarding, which you've been able to define here. So this whole process now has boomerang. Now they are calling us to come and um, synchronize the process and harmonize it. But then look at the cost of coming together now because the different organizations, like there are about three organizations in one main organization. So sometimes when we don't do the necessary onboarding, we are just postponing the evil day. So it will honors or the honors is on each and every one of us that is here, even whether for entry level, for senior executive, for mid careers, we should make it as a matter of policy and a matter of culture to inculcate this. Otherwise, we are just wasting and postponing the evil day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Rita, for your contribution. Madam Chidi, my over to you, ma. Is she still on the call? Maybe where there's still a question on the floor, if you have expatriates that you are bringing on board, are there any additional things you need to do? And anyone can also raise their hands to please respond to the question on expatriates on board. I'm trying to check for our facilitator if she's still online. If you'd like to wade in on tonight's conversation, please raise your hands. We unmute you and you can share your thoughts. This has been phenomenal. Thank you so much for all the messages, all the accolades comiums which are well deserved that we have dropped on the chat box okay i'm still waiting for our facilitator you have anything to say tonight help you have anything to say tonight i can see my boss here ahmed gobir you have anything to say We'll be glad to hear your voice. So I can see a question on board C suits, MD or HR. Who would like to respond to that question? Whose responsibility to respond to on board C for C suits to roads? Is it the managing director or the HR? I see another question here. I suspect, Adimala, I suspect your questions has been answered earlier during the session. I guess maybe you joined the session late, but you can watch the replay. Okay. All right. So let me just um, respond to one of the questions and then we'll probably call it a, a wrap. We've done 90 beautiful minutes tonight. So in my own opinion, with respect to C-suit onboarding, it is still HR's job to do that. However, it will be very good to get the active participation of, of the MD or COO or any other C-suit. So, for example, imagine you are onboarding, say, Chief Technical Officer, CTO. If you are not able to get maybe the Managing Director, you may be able to get the Chief Operating Officer or the Chief Financial Officer or a combination of, of, of the two, of course. Part of the onboarding process to the documentation you will have done upfront while you are even doing the recruitment, you will have gotten the buy of the MD. And also, you know, some of the challenges C-suit members have is timing. So that when you speak with them, find a time that they will be available to handle certain portions of the induction and the onboarding of 
All right. Let me see. Somebody's also asking a question. Let I'm checking now. So I, I'm standing in for the first. If staff are leaving due to poor management in the organization, for instance, if the staff are not getting what they want, get debited unfairly, as treatment, blah, blah, blah. So again, HR will always have a significant portion of the play. As long as the HR is in the organization, then it is your job to get convince the management, appeal to the management, coerce the management to do the right thing, the professional things, the things that we should do in line with, with the labor law. So if you stick with the organization, you stay with the organization then, you also stay with the blade, okay? I know that sometimes, depending on where some of us work, maybe it's a one-man business, or even if it's a PLC, but it's a dominant MD or a dominant personality, we must look for ways, either through enlightenment. And let me say this, I worked in one or two places and one of the best things I did in or the chairman to go for an executive course in a reputable business school. They spent like one week there. Guess what? Some of their behaviors changed. You know, it may not be easy for you to talk to someone who is older than you, senior to you, or much more importantly, way richer than you. They will say, you have all this wisdom. Why is your pocket not uh, looking like it. But when they go for some of these executive courses and they interact with other, so to speak, influential people, so maybe your CEO needs to go for a CEO executive course, okay? Please, if you can do that for them, it's an investment by the organization. But some of the things HR has been trying to communicate either directly or subtly, you know, if you don't want to hear it, from this side, and you from outside, um, you 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 will change. But don't stay in the organization and then want to just blame the MD or be responsible. I, I know a question here from DM referencing the KPI parts on the HR or the recruitment team, where there is stagnancy on the same grade. Okay, boarding, management, or HR. Again, again, don't let us, our job tonight, and even on the job, is not to apportion blame. Because once it is not your fault, you can't solve a problem that is not your fault. That's one thing um, I've discovered in my short stay in HR. But as an HR professional, one thing I can also say for free is that sometimes, even when something is not your direct business, but it affects the business of the organization, you have to interfere. You have to be involved. You have to be, uh, you know. So there, are, even from recruitment, there are some play on people when you are trying to recruit them. You already know in this organization, promotion is once in four years. Let them know up front. That way, the people who won't take the job won't take it. The people who are comfortable so to speak, with that kind of promotion side. So, for example, if you are going to the civil service, you know that they don't promote in civil service every year. And people are fine with it because it's a standard, but there is information up front. People know maybe it's a three or a four-year cycle uh, promotion uh, exams and so on and so forth. You know, see, sometimes what some of us do, people in HR, and just yesterday, just yesterday, and um, Rita, who was somewhere, one of our guys, colleagues, another HR colleague was telling us, Real life story that somebody sued him, his organization, the MD. They now sued him as head of HR. Do you know why they sued him? They sued my our colleague for false representation. In other words, they claim the candidate who took him to court said he said all the things he said about the organization were lies. Please, you know, there's what we call realistic job interview. Say it as it is. Don't if don't don't try and sugarcoat it. Don't paint the organization like paradise when in the real sense the organization is ass. Okay. Don't also make hell look like paradise. Say it the way it is. It, this is not about being. Uh, this is not about demarcating the organization. It's providing factual. Actual. I've worked recruited for a firm before. Even in the adverts, I was careful. I stated it there. Their capacity to work with a dominant one-man business and a family-dominated organization should apply. Somebody chatted me up and said, ah, this thing you put in this advert, people won't apply. Say, I'll 
I prefer nobody applies than someone lives a very cool environment, then joins a dominant place and then accuses me that I ruined their career. I gave the truth. But guess what? People still apply. People were even justifying that, oh, I've worked in six one-man dominant business. I have a very thick skin. At the end of the day, we were happy. But I will not lie or sugarcoat and paint an organization that is not good as excellent. Or let's let's say the reality. So as we begin to wrap up, Uche says great learning. We do overlook the importance of effective onboarding most times. With this class tonight, thank you so much, madam. All right. Um, Boma says, concerning the involvement of HODs in onboarding, due to timing, I find that it makes the process unpredictable and difficult to plan. As a situation no one... Okay. Okay. A situation no one is equipped to carry the process, what can be done? So what I will suggest, this is what I've done in some of the places I've worked and what I've seen. Um, so, you know, sometimes people resume sometimes in organizations, maybe at the first of the month or at the middle of the month. If it's a large organization, you can have a structured onboarding program. It can be quarterly. So just four times in a year. And then you'll have books with the HODs and the other stakeholders. They already know that maybe the first three days of the of a quarter is for onboarding. That way you can block the calendar up front. You will have discussed, it will have been part of the HR plan. That way they don't see your onboarding program or process as disruptive to the organization. Of course, when you're also choosing the date, you must understand your industry. So if, for example, the first 30 days of, the, of a new quarter is a busy period, don't put it. It can be the last 30 days. It can be the middle 30 days. So I just use that hypothetical. Look for a window in your organization and industry that is relatively like a downtime so that you can get the best of the facilitators, the participants, and, and, and the structure. And somehow to always you know, carry the HODs and stakeholders along. If the HOD, for instance, is not available, there may be another senior team member that they can delegate the work to. So don't also be fixated that it must be HOD. There may be one, two, three other managers who may also be equally competent and available because timeliness is also part of it. Okay, I think I... I have good news. Madam is back. I'm giving her admin rights back so that she can unmute, share her thoughts, take her closing comments, and we say good night. Yeah, welcome oh, back. Oh, thank, thank you very much. I really do appreciate that. I heard, thank you for holding forth. <laughs> this is our network thing. So just in addition to what you said, I also think what she said in a situation where blind heads are not equipped. I'm assuming that when she talks of equipping, she means um, training. They are not well trained. They don't have the knowledge, the skills to onboard their team members. I think that most of the time we need to train the line heads, particularly in smaller organizations. You find out that some people are just promoted to the position of line head because they are the most senior person there. Not senior in terms of experience, but they join the organization first. Every other people come behind them. So when the line here resign, you just say, who is the most oldest person? Oh, yeah, move. No training, no preparation. Those days, I started my career at UAC. For you to become a manager, you attend two years management development course. And even all through, the person would have been through a supervisory course, four-man course, so they are well prepared. But because of cost of training and the sizes of the organizations we work in these days, Sometimes you don't find that. Can you still hear me? Am I being heard? Yes, I found clear. Okay. So sometimes you we okay. So sometimes we don't get that. So it's from time to time, it's important that we train our line heads on the process of appraisal, performance management, employee onboarding, and even HR. Managing human resources because they are the actual line managers. The HR department, our job most of the time is to form policies and drive the execution of these policies. But the actual day to day management of human resources is done by the line heads. We should be conscious of that and ensure that we train them 
in terms of equipping them with skills to do it. And then if we set it as their KPI, as part of their job expectation, as part of what they are going to be evaluated for at the end of the appraisal period, I believe that they would also then take it more seriously. Because some, only, I mean, some of them will forever tell you that they don't have time. They are busy. They are this. So if you do not insist, it will not happen. And if it is not being measured, of course, they will not do it. That, thank you. I, that's my country. In addition to what you said, there's someone is saying here, as a HR working in a small and medium organization, please, what are the activities I should engage in? Everything. When I say everything, I mean from training, in-house training for your employee, for your employee performance management, everything, surveys. In fact, being in a small organization make it better. That's what I think. So let's not take the fact that, oh, because this organization is small, I don't need to do this, I don't need to do that. Everything that HR is supposed to do from the beginning to the end. If you are supposed to do monthly appraisal session, then do monthly appraisal session because that's the way it's supposed to be. Create trainings. If they cannot go out, apart from picking, selecting trainings for um, employees and lime heads to attend, do some in-house. Create team bonding activities, maybe every weekend. It helps. In fact, when the organization is bigger, you are overwhelmed and then reaching out to staff is very difficult. But when it's even smaller, in a small organization, look for activities that, has to, that will bring in job satisfaction, team bonding, training, experience sharing. You can even start book review. There's nothing you cannot do when it's a small organization, as long as it yields results. From um, regular check-ins to, to stay interviews, you know what we call stay interviews, checking on your employee and make sure that they are happy, see if they have challenges, to team bonding session, to appraisal, you can do quarterly because the size is less. Do everything, irrespective of the size. It just makes it easier for you to do. The only challenge I think you may experience is that for that size of the organization, the, the executives may not understand, or they may keep pushing back to say, oh, it's too expensive, we can't approve this, what is the value? Then you must then begin to look for um, programs that may not cost money, that doesn't have to cost money. I think uh, Oli Amish shared some great ideas the last one time he presented about some ideas that you don't have to spend money on, yet it can happen. And it will yield great results. And once you do it, you discover that the line, the executive management, the top manager will begin to buy into it because they are seeing results. Also measure, measure the performance of, of your program so that when you are reporting, you can say X, Y, Z, our attrition rate reduced by this, our employee engagement rate is this, our leave. So that also helps. So I do not think that we should be, and uh, my colleagues are putting things here, employee engagement programs, training and development, succession planning, just do all the whole process, all your HR activities. Do not leave anyone. That's my thought. Then you, you, I mean, you asked a question, you say for expatriate, would there be something extra? Yes, I think there's a lot extra because beyond what we do for everyone in the organization, there's this cultural onboarding we must do. Legal onboarding we must do. So what comes to my mind is, it's not about them getting used to the um, company, its processes, the colleagues there and things like, we must, it, it then becomes a big, uh, more on us, our responsibility as HR, who brought them in to educate them on what is acceptable or not in our culture. You know, every culture has its own uh, peculiarities. This expatriate is coming, it's not a Nigerian, that's what it means. So we must educate them. We must also make sure they are up to speed with our legal requirements. What happens in the UK may not happen here. What happened here may not happen here. What the road science is, how to deal with the enforcement agents, and what to do if such things happen. We may also need to educate them on the social part of our environment. What to be careful of, what to take the security situation, how to be security conscious, even within their environment, how to relate with their neighbors. So it's a whole, we must do something different. It has to do with cultural onboarding. It has to do with legal onboarding. 
it has to do with um, social onboarding. So you may find, because there is also language barrier there, so you may find out that you give them, you appoint for them a body who is at their level, who they can reach out to, not just the HR, reach out to at every point in time that they need help. So ask, how do I do this? What do I need to do this to do? What do I need to do if I need something like this? Because this is a, a, a peculiar kind of onboarding beyond what when they come to work. They, they are going to live in the society. Even if you give them a guest house, they are going to live somewhere in the, in the society. They are going to interact with other people. And they are our responsibilities. Thank you. I, I don't know if I answered your question. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay. And one question more here. Someone here is saying that apart from policy and job description, what other things can one teach during the onboarding? Okay. We, uh, even on the group here, you can see vision, mission. Personal effectiveness training is key. Team bonding is key. The performance management process and feedback process is key. Communication skill is also key. And we may look for trainings that help us to ensure that they understand how we work in the organization and what is expected of them. So I have I found out that for onboarding, usually when it comes to trainings on personal effectiveness, you know these seven um where is this book Stephen Covey it's also a very good book for onboarding process so I think that that helps communication skill is also very good because you know what the way we write email in our organization the way we communicate in every organization is different and we I find out that most employees struggle with our communication sometimes you see someone send an email and you feel like looking for the person to slap the person the person doesn't mean any harm, but it's just their own way of writing. Particularly for our Gen Zs, someone sends you an email and you're just saying, oh, uh, one direct email that looks like the person is insulting you or insulting the line head. It may be very good to also include communication skill. So it may also be good to let them know, let the new employees know how we communicate within the organization and how not to communicate within the organization, what the core value stands for and how it is being applied. So all these are part of the things that should be captured in our onboarding system. Team bonding, how to work in teams. So people come into our organization from where they are coming from. Maybe they just like working in silos. So we need to also ensure that we put programs in place to teach them how to work in teams, whether they know it before or not. Let's not assume. But as part of bringing them in and making sure that they settle well, we also need to do that. Personal effectiveness, that is very key. Interpersonal skill, that is also important. I, I, I believe that there are several others. So, but I hope that I've been able to point out some. Thank you so much, ma'am. I also added that you could do, as part of the body, a session by all the strategic departments or business units so that they talk about their activities, what they do, how they support the business. That way, you, the new employees, you have an end-to-end -end view and appreciation of the workflow of the organization and their value chain. And then they will know appreciate the value each department and how their own job role and their own department fits into the organization. We'll quickly take Malik. Malik, you have the floor, okay. please. You can before, Mal before Malik comes up, let me just add that, like in my organization, that is part of what we do is that from day one, we draw up a schedule where the yeah, new employee gets to be okay, with that's... each department and they have that interaction. And HR will sit in to make sure that that is exactly what is done. So they share what they do and they take questions from the employee. So that is a very important thing you just added, Olu. I mean, thank you very much. You can also add health and safety. So that is being mentioned. Process of logistics 
if they need to attend, if they need to request for logistics, that is also and what compensation and others that the company provides. So thank you. Malik. You're welcome. Malik. Oga has yeah, okay. already called you. Okay, th th thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Facilitator, Mr. Adioshu. And uh, Madam, you have uh, you have done very well. We appreciate you. I just want to share uh, my own thoughts, my own experience on one uh, important issue. The first one is uh, the line of communication that you mentioned, I mean, the last one you just discussed, that is so important during onboarding to teach those who are coming on board on pattern of communication in that organization. It has caused a lot of problem and it has also... Uh, a kind of uh, uh, make some of them to not want to in, uh, involve themselves again in communication in that organization. This is what I mean. Uh, some of them, they will come without knowing the, the way and manner we communicate in that organization. So they will just go and write something. And once they are uh, reprimanded, they will, you, see, you find out that they will just stay, uh, they will just want to stay, you know, uh, not want to get close to that again. But if it is done properly at the beginning during onboarding, it is always very helpful. That's, I just feel as just uh, share that. The second one is on the uh, onboarding for expatriates. I think one of the things is that uh, that is very important is uh, cultural cultural onboarding, especially in the area of uh, what we call uh, power distance. In power distance in overseas, especially those coming from UK or European in European countries, they always like to call them by first name or something like that. And our people want to put Mr. Our people want to put Sir. And they find out that. So what, what I'm trying to say that it's always good to equally want to hear from them and tell them that here, we have this respect. We don't really want to you know, go into their own power distance. We don't, we, we respect power distance, but we are always want to put respect in, we always want to put respect in communicating with them. But they find it very difficult sometimes at time to interact with you. They don't like Mr. They just want to just call me John, just call me this. But here we want to put Mr. or Prof or something like that. I just feel I should share that thought that cultural onboarding is very important too. Thank you very much. Very, very, very useful, timely contribution. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, Malik. Thank you, sir. So we'll take the final question for tonight. Final question. And it's from DME. Ma, DME is saying, is it advisable to schedule a quarterly induction or onboarding for employees in job change, promotion in a large Employee workforce organization, Madam Chidi. The question says, is it advisable to schedule quarterly onboarding for employees on job change? Is that what she said? Yeah. Yes. That means or employees promotion. that move into new roles. Yes, ma'am. I think it's it's important, although she's saying it's a large organization. It's important that we take out time. I mentioned that during my presentation. We take out time to check on them. We should not assume. I said that it's very important, particularly for, especially for employees that are changing roles. It is sometimes we assume that because they've been in the organization and maybe they even asked to move to that department that is fine. It's not fine. We need to check on them. Some of them may be struggling with their new departments their new job, they may even be confused. We may find out that their productivity reduced and the line head keep complaining that, ah, what's wrong with this? So I thought she was doing well. Now she's here. Is this what she's been doing in her other department? It may be that they are just confused and they need clarification. And you would not know if you assume and just stay back. And then maybe at the end of six months, you send requests to the line head for confirmation on that role or in that position or during... Uh, performance um, feedback, you then at the end of the year or at the end of six months, and you are getting a report that this person has performed poorly. It is always better to check on them. I found it very beneficial. Although the size of your organization, but we find time. We don't have to do it at once. We can say weekly, we take a number. It doesn't have to be for the whole day. It can be a one hour session to say, how are you doing? It can also be asking the line head how they are doing and using that as a basis for conversation with them. I, I had um, a couple that stayed with us for one year and then was re uh, re uh, retained. And after three months, when we checked with the line head, it was okay, confidential report. The one we were seeing was scary, very, very abysmal. 
And this was someone that was a top, in fact, he became a supervisor of all the um, coppers we had because he would do even things you didn't ask him to do, take care of things, go online. He was working very hard. Therefore, the line had to give that kind of report. We had to call him to sit down to find out how, um, how what happened and what's happening to him because that wasn't our expectation. He was our top performer. We struggled to keep, in fact, he asked for a higher pay than we were willing to give. We still gave just because we wanted to keep him. And the feedback we got was quite educating because we then found out that, um, one, there is peer influence where people have been telling him, ah, you are doing too much. That's one. The other is that the line had probably issued a query for something he did and he started sulking. You see, that's what they mean by communication. That's probably the first time he was given a query. And he probably thought that, ah, if I've been working this hard for this long and then just one, am I being heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, and then just one mistake I'm being given, uh, my line head is reacting like, so he withdrew into his shell and that didn't help matter. So imagine that we didn't check. Six months down the line, the line head would have just told us that it's not, it's, it's not a good fit. And you'll be wondering, because I was already screaming that this, has, this was a star copper. What happened? So that is the benefit of that quarterly checking and maybe quarterly reminder, because when you check in, you will know the gap and you know where you can apply your next intervention. I hope I answered your question. Thank you so, so much, Madam Chidi Justina OBJC. This has been a very excellent session tonight. On behalf of the over 80 people who joined this live session and the several thousands who will be watching on YouTube, we'd like to express our profound gratitude to you tonight for sharing so generously out of your wealth of experience, out of your depth of knowledge. Thank you so much for not holding back. We also like to appreciate everyone tonight who has either asked a question, gave an insight either in the chat or even via voice. We'd like to appreciate all of us. We'll keep doing our best to add value to each other. And we like to end by saying, please, ladies and gentlemen, let's stay strong. Things are tough, but under pressure, greatness will emerge. We will all emerge better for this. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. We call it Tera. Good night, everyone. Thank Bye. you, Oluyemi. It's my pleasure. Very happy to be here. And I've also learned today. God bless Thank you, you all. And please, anytime. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed You're myself welcome. and I've learned. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Oga. Thank you, man.